On Memorial Day 1978, I dropped dead. Ten days later, I would leave UCLA Medical Center with this prescription. Don't walk upstairs. Don't go anywhere without someone who knows CPR. Give up your motocross career. Take heart medication for the rest of your life. You have over a 50% chance of dying in the next two years. And if you're lucky, you'll survive sex. That turning point launched my personal quest for optimal health. Without the ability to perform even moderately strenuous physical activities, my diet became crucial to my personal well-being and my survival. First, I went with the U.S. government's conventional advice, following the USDA's low-fat, high-carb food pyramid recommendations. I soon learned that following the food pyramid left me constantly hungry, hypoglycemic, and over-obsessing about everything I ate. I continued searching, reading everything I could get my hands on about natural health. I experimented with a wide variety of eating methods, cleansing fasts, and dietary philosophies to see if they could help me be my healthiest, including macrobiotics, juicing, water fasts, the master cleanse, natural hygiene's food combining, and vegetarianism. I also explored spiritual disciplines and their dietary ideas, and ultimately became a raw food vegan, an effort to find both health and the same inner peace I'd felt during my near-death experience on the running track. For over five years, I ate only uncooked fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and sprouts, an experience that inspired my first book, The Christ Diet, Connect Your Cells to Your Soul. But as time passed and life stresses tested my resilience, I didn't feel as good physically or emotionally as when I first began a vegan diet. The defining moment for me was my mother's death at the hands of a drunk driver. My dietary discipline, no matter how well-intentioned, wasn't providing my body, mind, or spirit with the materials I needed to recover from the physical and emotional impact of my loss. In fact, it wasn't long before my inner voice began crying out for real protein. During these same years, as I became a writer and broadcast journalist, we've seen a new national crisis emerge, an epidemic of overweight, obesity, and diet-related chronic disease that is now the number one killer in the U.S. and spreading unchecked to developed countries around the globe. The confusion for most Americans is that we see and hear so much contradictory advice that we don't really understand what to eat for optimal health. How can we deal with a national obesity epidemic when most of us aren't even sure how to lose our own excess body fat? In fact, 10 years ago, a National Harris Poll said 80% of Americans over 25 were overweight. And ABC News declared that Americans are fat and just too confused to do anything about it. The public is confused not because what are known as facts continue to change. The public is confused because what the media and special interest groups and large corporations selling foods, etc., would like you to currently believe as a fact keeps on being changed. 90% of the people that I see have no clue and they're just jumping from one thing to the next thing on a daily basis. I think we just need to ditch the whole thing and reconceptualize and reteach nutrition. From a very basic point of view, I think we complicate it too much. I have spent a fair amount of time in, in hospital scenarios and it's tragic when you see some of the, the compounding factors of obesity and how it shortens lives, how it decreases the quality of life. So it, it, it's a, a tragedy in that regard, particularly when we're seeing more and more uh, children affected by it. People will not be able to afford the cost of chronic obesity mm -hmm. and diabetes mm -hmm. and all of the complications that we're come We're spending $147 billion a year because of obesity-related uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've seen the, the rate increase among kids in all, in all communities, in the African-American and Hispanic communities, the numbers are even uh, worse. Add to the mix our new personal media devices, and escaping our uncertainty is made increasingly difficult because we are surrounded by a never-ending cycle of ever-changing diet recommendations and emotionally charged nutritional beliefs. Everywhere we go, every day of our lives. There are three things in life which are very visceral. Religion, politics, and nutrition. They're all based on belief systems, and none of them respond well to challenge. Essentially, they say, don't confuse me with the facts because in my heart, I know I'm right. A quick Google search on healthy eating reveals literally thousands of contradictory messages, 
medical entertainment shows, superficial news coverage, inaccurate reporting, and personal opinions delivered as fact, fueling even more confusion. Nobody's really interested in delineating the distinctions here and educating people and allowing them to make a, a, an informed choice. We look for sensationalism, and so they create a very false dichotomy right out of the gate that uh, usually the, the person presenting information like this, uh, Gary Tobbs and some other people have been kind of uh, uh, waylaid by these, these setups, essentially. Health is not simply the absence of disease. Health is being healthy. And a lot of people have no disease, but they never get enough sleep, they can't get out of bed in the morning, they don't have all the energy they need for the things they do, they have to visit a doctor two or three times you know, in a six month period, they're at their chiropractor every week, they take two or three over-the-counter pain meds, two or three anti-inflammatories, a bunch of antihistamines. That's not health. They don't have a diagnosed illness, and they are not healthy. And that's most of the public. The tragic end result of this confusion is that in the U.S. alone, it's estimated that between three and 400,000 people die every year from complications directly related to their diet. That means in 10 years, four million more of us will be dead from largely preventable causes, a statistic that should stop us in our tracks and push us to search for an immediate solution. Yet what remains is an invisible epidemic without a face. Sadly, unless we see the horror for ourselves on live television, as we did September 11, 2001, we don't seem to grasp the very real threat to ourselves and our loved ones. With all due respect to those who lost their lives that day, their friends and loved ones, take a moment to consider this analogy. The largely preventable deaths of the three to 400,000 people who die every year from disease caused by the diet they eat every day is about 100 9-11s, essentially the same as one 9-11 every three days, year in and year out, with no end in sight. Dropping dead was easy that hot Memorial Day in 1978 compared to what I had to face later. That day, at the age of 24, I felt no pain, had no visible scars, and soon moved forward with getting my life back together. Then 22 years later at age 46, due to increasing irregular heartbeats and difficulty breathing, I had to have a cardiac defibrillator implanted in my left chest muscle, which would restart my heart if I collapsed again. The implant was a physically painful and dispiriting reminder of my mortality I could see and feel every day. I didn't know how much time I had left to live, but I was determined to use what time I had to make a difference. This was the beginning of my unprecedented 10-year global journey to find the perfect human diet. Albert Einstein once said, we can't solve problems with the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Similarly, when I was a boy and I really wanted to know the answer to a complex or confusing question, my parents gave me some simple advice to open up my mind to new ways of thinking. First, they said, dive in and do your own homework. Second, be willing to look past conventional thinking for clues and alternative points of view. And finally, don't be afraid to go back and start at the beginning and see where it leads you. Using that model, Preparing to search for the perfect human diet required me to do some homework on a few nutritional pioneers that are flying under the radar of conventional dietary thinking. The West Coast Repository for one of the largest libraries of books and media dedicated to preserving the works of the nutritional pioneers is the Price Poninger Nutrition Foundation in San Diego, California, where I spoke with the Foundation Board Vice President, David Getoff. The foundation is uh, set up to do two main things, uh, to archive the works of all the nutrition pioneers, uh, and the other is to promote the information that was derived from all that work, and to have people understand that the way in the ways in which the population of the planet, you know, not of the U.S. or anything, any particular little area, but the planet uh, ate when they were researched by 
Weston Price when he travels you know, around our, our, our world looking at all sorts of different tribal and traditional populations that had not yet been influenced by all of the uh, things that we're all influenced by because there wasn't anything around them. They were still eating in the traditional methods that they had very unbelievably extremely good health, that they had a, a completely different looking face, which some people today might not even like because we've gotten used to the thin faces that have developed from improper feeding, which is pretty cute actually, it's very interesting. But the jaw structure and the skull was large enough that you didn't have to remove your wisdom teeth because there wasn't room for them. You didn't have to pull two or three other teeth out for orthodontia and then uh, work on an overbite or underbite. None of those things happened because we were all eating correctly. What I say in classes is, is generally that the, the longest running and most comprehensive and the largest number of people in the actual group of research that has ever been done on the human diet is called the history of the world. And so when somebody takes a small research study that went on for six months or ten years and it seems to show something which Weston Price's research showed the opposite of, then the new research is wrong. Because Weston Price's research was specifically designed to look at tribal populations that had been eating the same diet for many multiple generations and that they still had perfect health. Another modern nutritional pioneer flying under the radar of conventional dietary thinking is Professor Karen O'Day, currently of the University of South Australia. About 30 years ago, Professor O'Day conducted a study in Derby, Australia, which illustrated a traditional method of eating's potential to restore health to a population in decline due to dietary changes. Professor O'Day examined a group of Australian Aborigines who had originally grown up in the bush as hunter-gatherers. They knew which foods to pick and gather, they knew how to make weapons to kill kangaroos and dig out wallabies, and knew where and in what season to find both wild game and plants. But as early adults, they became westernized. They moved into small towns and cities and started to eat western foods. They became fat. They developed health issues like type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So Professor O'Day asked the group, would you be willing to go out to the outback for a seven-week experiment and become hunter-gatherers again? They agreed. She took them out to their traditional country in an isolated location where they lived off the land as hunter-gatherers. Depending on whether the group was on the coast or inland, their diet varied, eating from 54 to 80 percent animal protein, 13 to 40 percent fat, and from 5 to 33 percent wild fibrous carbohydrates. Lo and behold, they lost weight. The insulin resistance, the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol, everything normalized when they re-established their former traditional lifestyles. All this improvement came in just seven weeks on a diet predominantly animal in origin, an average of 64% animal-based foods. And interestingly enough, exercise was not a factor in their improvements. Professor O'Day determined that the group was actually less physically active in the bush than in the city. A current test of a traditional method of eating's ability to restore health has been undertaken by Canadian physician Dr. Jay Wartman, who became interested in the relationship between diet and diabetes in the First Nations peoples of Canada. First Nations are one of the Aboriginal peoples in Canada and they have terrible problems with obesity, metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. And I think it's got a lot to do with the change, a dramatic change from a traditional diet to a modern diet that is not a very healthy diet. Well, the traditional diet in this part of the world was very low in carbohydrates. And it consisted of game, seafood, all kinds of fish, and some wild edible plants, usually seasonal, seasonal plants like berries and certain greens that are eaten at uh, certain times of the year. But a diet that's very low in starch and sugar content. And so it got me interested in the modern low carbohydrate diet. So I looked at the research in low carbohydrate diets and found that people who had diabetes or metabolic syndrome or just obesity uh, benefited a lot from being a modern, on a modern low carbohydrate diet. So I got interested in that relationship, uh, the traditional diet, the fact that it was low in carbohydrates, the change in that diet which is a big, big increase in carbohydrates 
and the advent of these, uh, these diseases. In my travels, uh, I go into a lot of remote communities and meet with people. I started questioning the elders about the diet. Like, what, was your, what were your traditional foods? And what kinds of foods did you eat? And I started collecting stories and it became very evident to me that their diet was very low in carbohydrate. Everybody was very interested and uh, we selected a community where it looked like it may work and started uh, developing a study there and it, it, it surprised me actually in, in some ways the enthusiasm, the uptake. Uh, people immediately understood that the connection between their traditional ways and this dietary approach made sense to them. It resonated very strongly with them because there's a, there's a whole renaissance going on in terms of the culture. I feel like I'm the guy standing by the train tracks and I know that the bridge is out down around the corner and I'm waving at the train <laughs> saying, stop, stop, and they all look at me like I'm crazy. And uh, it's interesting because uh, in the niche where I work with this diet with First Nations people, when I connect the dots for them and I say, think about your traditional diet, think about what your elders ate, your ancestors, and think about the foods that you eat today and how your diet has changed, the light bulbs go on. So I find it very rewarding to work in this population because they get it. They get it very quickly and it makes a lot of sense to them that the diet they're eating today may in fact be the cause of a lot of the health problems they have. So that very strong resonance of this idea in this population gives me hope that we will make a difference with this approach. And if we make a difference here, it's going to be hard for everybody else to ignore. For my next phase of preparation, I began searching for perspectives we are unlikely to hear in the mainstream media's coverage of popular dietary advice, beginning with vegetarianism. Coincidentally, the San Francisco Vegetarian Society's 7th Annual World Vegetarian Festival opened just as I was preparing to start my trip. It seemed like a perfect opportunity to hear the current thinking in the vegetarian and vegan world from both the participants and the movement's professional leaders. How you doing? I'm seeing a documentary called In Search of the Perfect Human Diet. Does somebody want to talk to us about your magazine and what you do and why you're here and all that good stuff? It's a perfect fusion of both my passions, vegetarian lifestyle, even a focus on veganism with the whole publishing aspect of a magazine. And you're vegan? I'm vegan, life, almost lifelong, since I was two. <laughs> really? That's, wow. that's, that's pretty amazing. I've been vegetarian 22 years. I'm just recently vegan, though, so I'm vegan now. <laughs> so we know in America that people aren't eating right. I mean, most people know you're supposed to eat more fruits and vegetables, right? I don't tell people they should eat more fruits and vegetables. I tell people, you know, and how they say, how many servings of fruits and vegetables? Five a day, six a day, eight a day? And I say, no, stop counting. Don't add fruits and vegetables to the core of your diet. Make fruits and vegetables the diet. You follow that? Then we can count what things we eat, a couple of this and a couple of that, that aren't fruits and vegetables. But most of what we eat should be fruits and vegetables, and our diet should be vegetable-based. A mistake that most vegetarians make is they think they need to make up for the lack of dead, decaying flesh in their diet. You don't need to make up for the lack of meat in your diet. You just need to get rid of the meat. Okay? And then you need to get all of your calories from whole natural foods, not from highly processed, heated, beaded, treated, chopped, diced, salted, sugared crap that's being sold at five times the cost of whole natural foods, because that's what people want. Tell us why you're here. I am the co-founder and creator of Tasty Eats. So I created soy jerky. Soy jerky? Yeah. Now that's interesting as an alternative to beef jerky. As a, yeah, absolutely, because beef jerky is just loaded with saturated fat, sodium, just artery clogging ingredients. Okay, mm -hmm. so beef is bad, soy is good. Absolutely. We're actually anatomically we are herbivores. We're not. We're, we're we're actually not carnivores. The way our digestive system works, we're actually better suited to be vegetarians. Vegetarians obviously don't eat meat, and they they have a real problem with foods of animal origin. So if you advocate a low carb diet, and you pretty much are telling people to eat meat, and it doesn't have to be. I mean, we've had patients a lot of patients that have been vegetarian and have done fine. I mean, they have to work to do it, and they have to take some supplements, but they can do it and they can do fine. Uh, but, but 
for the most part, if you advocate a higher protein diet, you're advocating a meat diet. And people that are vegetarians look for every reason to not eat meat, and up to and including trying to promote this idea that it's healthy, that if the vegetarian way of life is, is a healthier way of life, which is not true. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, that are, are sort of articles to physicians on how to deal with patients on vegetarian diets, not to get them off the vegetarian diets, but how to, uh, you know, what kind of treatment problems you're going to run into. I mean, it's an aberration. It's not the way of man. I mean, we've got a carnivorous GI tract. There are two kinds of GI tracts, basically. There's a carnivorous and there's an herbivorous. And an herbivorous GI tract is, you know, got multiple stomachs, a lot of herbivores, because the, the, the nutrient density in plant foods is, is so low, but animals, cows that eat grass and things like that, that's really not very nutritious. They have to eat all the time. A lot of these vegetarian animals regurgitate their food and rechew it and re-swell it. Some of them even eat their own feces to recycle it to try to extract every little bit of nutrient out of it. But the, the main thing is they have to eat all the time. And we don't do that. We can eat once a day and do fine. We can eat once every two or three days and do fine, just like lions can. I mean, we've got a carnivorous GI tract. So, and vitamin B12, which is only found in foods of animal origin, is essential to us. I mean, if we don't get vitamin B12, we die. It's an essential nutrient. So that right there in and of itself with nothing else is an argument against the fact that our natural state is, is, is vegetarians. It's nonsense. What is commonly referred to as the low-carb diet, recently gaining wider media and medical acceptance, reframed as low glycemic, had its beginnings in 1863 with the first popular diet book ever written, Banting's Letter on Corpulence, addressed to the public. In 1862, London undertaker William Banting was 65, five foot five inches tall and weighed 202 pounds. So fat, in fact, he wrote that he couldn't stoop to tie his shoes became winded with every slight exertion, was losing his eyesight and hearing, and had to walk downstairs backwards to avoid knee and ankle pain. After 30 years of failure trying everything we're still advised to do today, including reducing fat, cutting calories, and exercising more, one doctor finally prescribed a diet that advised him to, quote, abstain as much as possible from bread, butter, milk, sugar, beer, and potatoes which had been the mainstay of his diet for years, and eat instead three meals per day, primarily of meat, fish, poultry, or game, very small amounts of dry toast and fruit, any vegetable except potatoes, tea without milk and sugar, and dry wine, and no strict restrictions on the quantity of food at his meals. In August of 1863, Banting wrote in his booklet that at 66 years of age, he had dropped 35 pounds in 38 weeks and later, 50 pounds by early 1864. His eyesight and hearing improved, he could exercise freely, and yes, he could finally walk downstairs forwards with perfect ease. His book became a phenomenal success, ruffled the feathers of some in the medical community and popular press, and his name became part of the Queen's English as a verb, meaning to diet. You know, we know that Banting came out with his diet in 1863, published it, but what, how did the medical community respond? And what people don't realize is that, for the most part, the medical community decided that Banting was right. So these diets would recommend meat and green vegetables, and that was the basis of a diet. If you went to the obesity textbooks, or the medical textbooks, or William Osler, who was the most famous physician of the, you know, turn of the, 20th century, the early years of the 20th century, in his medical textbook he says, you know, fat children come to see me or fat women come to see me, I tell them to give up carbohydrates, starches and sweets. And you get rid of added fats as well, by which they meant butter, lard, you know. So you're eating the basis of the medical establishment's typical diet through the 1960s would have been some amount of meat and green vegetables. Every diet restricted carbohydrates. And then the question was whether or not you were going to restrict fats as well. And this isn't actually through 1910, say from 1865 to 1965. For a century, if you went to a hospital and were treated for obesity, you were told to give up carbohydrates. Now, of course, it's obvious to anyone following the media's coverage of diet and health stories 
that the low-carb prescription is not conventional medical advice, begging the question, what happened to the science of nutrition and weight loss that had guided medicine for the preceding 100 years? You know, in the 1950s, we started coming up with this idea that fat causes heart disease. And if you're gonna tell people to eat less fat, you gotta tell them to eat more carbohydrates. So this, the idea of the fattening carbohydrate and the idea of removing carbs first from a weight loss diet in the 1960s vanished to be replaced with the idea that dietary fat is a problem and carbohydrates are now, not only are they heart healthy, but the basis of a good and healthy diet is supposed to be a lot of carbohydrates. Um, Jane Brody, the New York Times personal health reporter, this is their 1985 Good Food book. And the subtitle is Living the High Carbohydrate Way. And she actually says in the book that when she was raised, she was raised to believe that potatoes, bread, pasta, rice were fattening. Lo and behold, they're not, and you can eat as many of them as you want. And now a diet becomes, a weight loss diet becomes the exact opposite of what it was. Now it's a, a weight loss diet is low in fat and high in carbohydrates, and particularly those carbohydrates that everybody believed was fattening until the 1960s. Bread, pasta, potatoes, just don't put fat on it. Don't put butter on it, don't put cheese on it. That's what makes you fat. And the fascinating thing about this switch, this paradigm shift, is that there was no evidence to support it. There was this belief that fat caused heart disease by its effect on cholesterol and nothing else. You know, absolutely nothing else. We changed at least a century of established wisdom on what constituted not just a healthy diet but a weight reduction diet based on a belief that dietary fat caused heart disease. You know, we have come out of the era in which fat is demonized as the bad macronutrient. But that legacy is still very much with, with us. I still see that when people are telling, giving people nutritional advice, talking about weight control, I still see the emphasis on fatty foods and people talking about high fat foods and cutting down on fat consumption and low fat foods. Fat does not make you fat. You know, this is a very important concept. Fat does not make you fat. What is driving the obesity epidemic in this country is the very high consumption of high glycemic load carbohydrate foods, which have been technically manipulated. The famous Framingham Heart Study was used to promote uh, margarine and other foods that did not contain saturated fat. But as, in fact, this study found that those who ate the most saturated fat the most cholesterol and even the most calories weighed the least, had lower levels of serum cholesterol and were more physically active. So the three biggest risk factors for heart disease or what we consider risk factors were lower in people consuming more saturated fat. My Food Blade is the new graphical representation of the newly revised 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The plate replaces the well-known but confusing food pyramid in an effort to simplify the federal government's at-a-glance nutritional guidelines intended to promote health through improved nutrition. Using new, more generalized language, the new guidelines advise us to enjoy our food but eat less. Eat more vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and fat-free or 1% dairy products. And also to eat less of the foods that are high in saturated fats, sodium, and added sugars. Substantial changes to the actual recommendations made by the new food plate are few, leaving it essentially the same as the old pyramid. But what doesn't get much public attention is the methodology that has been used to create the U.S. Diet Guidelines. The guidelines are based on a report generated every five years by a specially selected review panel. The panel members decide what scientific evidence and testimony to include from all that is presented. What the panel chooses will then guide the nation's health policies for at least the next five years. I mean, for years, the, the mainstream has been telling us uh, academicians, and those are the people that the government always turns to, all the usual suspects, when they want to have a conference to decide how to do something, they go after the mainstream. And the mainstream has been wrong, 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 uh, nutritionally over the past 20 or 30 years. And so they get the advice from people that give them incorrect advice, and they act on it. and. Uh, and then we all suffer from it. From the start, our dietary recommendations have been based as much on politics as on science. 
The first set of dietary goals were written by political staffers, not by scientists or nutritionists. They were based then, that first set, on the as yet unproven theory that reducing dietary fat would reduce heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. They directed Americans to consume less fat, less sodium, less saturated fat, more carbohydrate, and these recommendations have remained remarkably consistent for 30 years. They come right out and they actually say vegetarian for, for kind of the first time. It's even more grain, more legume-based, a de-emphasis in animal-based proteins, which for me is absolute madness and is definitely driving the train in the wrong direction. And it, it's further problematic that there's no distinction made with, you know, when they say uh, plant-based proteins or, or grains, a snack well or a similar like highly refined, high fructose containing item is, is lumped in right, right along with a, a, a bowl of steel cut oats or pearled barley. With few people are eating those types of foods though. And it, even for me, those are not optimum foods. Those are, are marginal for the most part, which makes me sound like a crazy person, but let's take that then further steps of refinement and take that steel cut oat and make it instant oats, which we know that the, the glycemic and, and insulin generating effects of that type of food are so much more powerful than uh, the less processed forms. It, it's somewhat disheartening. I went to a farmer's co-op in Arkansas once and went in there and started looking at the labels on uh, the feed bags. And this guy comes over and asked me if he could help me. And I told him kind of what I was doing that I was, writing a book on nutrition and I wanted to see, you know, how you fattened up animals. And he said, well, you know, the guy that does this is upstairs. Let me take you up and he can talk to you. So we go up and the guy pulls out his, his book of uh, his manual of, of animal feeding, I think it was called. He looks down there and he said, yeah, this is where we come up with our formulas to, you know, to fatten cows, to fatten hogs, to do this, to do that. And so he made me some copies of these things. And so I took them home and I ran them through my nutritional computer just to see how it came out and it came out almost to the percent exactly what the USDA food pyramid is. So farmers basically use the USDA food pyramid to fatten their animals and so I refer to it as the feedlot pyramid. Now with initial preparations complete, it's time to start at the beginning of human evolution to see where it leads us. I travel to the University of Colorado in Fort Collins to meet with America's leading expert in evolutionary nutrition. Professor Lauren Cordain. The evolution by natural selection is the most powerful idea in all of medicine and biology. It's only been within the last decade, maybe 15 years, that the scientific and nutritional communities have become aware that indeed our nutritional requirements are shaped by our evolution. Probably about 1987, I read the classic paper by Dr. Boyd Eaton from Emory University called Paleolithic Nutrition that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I thought that was about the best idea I've ever heard of in my life. And uh, being somewhat of a uh, obsessive personality, I decided to follow up on this. And after I read the article, I went out, and there were 60 or 70 references to the article. I went out and got every one of those. And I read every one of those. And if you're a scientist, you realize that every article has references. And you basically can reference every paper that's ever been published, ever. And so I started to um, read these articles, and I started to put them in piles. They started to form these patterns, like milk, problems with drinking milk, problems with eating grains, problems with vegetable oil, and so forth. And then I started to file them. And you see these filing cabinets in here. I now probably have 10 or 15, 20,000 scientific articles. And they started to form sub-patterns, and the patterns, and blah, 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 blah. And so I started to get this insight into the whole thing. And one of the days, finally, in the early 90s, I got up the courage to call Boyd Eaton, because he was kind of my hero. Called him up on the telephone, and uh, very, he's a gentleman by the true sense of the word gentleman. And he, of course, entertained a telephone conversation from a complete stranger for about 45 minutes. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, well, it sounds to me like you know more about this than I do. To better illustrate the concept of evolutionary nutrition, Professor Cordain took me down to the football field to give human dietary evolution a sense of scale. And two million years ago was the very first appearance 
of a member, our, one of our ancestors called Homo erectus. And so we believe that this is the first member of the human genus Homo, which means man. And we believe that this is a crucial step in the evolution of the human diet. So this is a, basically the starting point. And uh, we can go back a half million years earlier, and that's when the first stone tools were made. But the first appearance of people that were anatomically very similar to us from the head down starts about two million years ago. Then Homo erectus leaves Africa and crosses into Europe. We find Homo erectus for the first time in a place called Damanisi. Damanisi is dated to about 1.7 to 1.8 million years ago. This is the first time we see Homo erectus moving to 40 degrees north latitude. Now the crucial idea at 40 degrees north latitude is that plant foods are not available all year round. So there's a number of months out of the year when there is nothing to eat but animal foods. After we pick up the fossil record from Damanisi in Georgia, the Homo erectus spreads throughout the rest of Asia. They go east to a site in China roughly 1.65 million years ago. And they spread all throughout Asia up to about 40 degrees north latitude, but they couldn't crack much higher latitudes than that because they probably hadn't mastered fire by that time. Then we have Homo spreading from southern Europe on into northern Europe, and we can go to Boxgrove in England about 500,000 years ago, between four and 500,000 years ago, where we can pick up the fossil record there. Boxgrove revealed a rich fossil record of big game animals and the butchering of large herbivores, including rhinoceros. Another famous European site is in Schönigen, Germany, dated to 400,000 years ago, where a series of wooden throwing spears were found. Radiocarbon dating has confirmed that three of the wooden spears found there are the oldest complete hunting weapons ever found. They were found with more than 10,000 animal bones, mostly from horses, including many that were butchered for edible meat. Then, at about 230,000 years ago, we first see evidence of Neanderthals in Europe. And the evidence suggests that, like early Homo, they were highly dependent upon animal foods. As our brain size increased, our behavioral sophistication also increased, and we were better able to hunt animal food. We weren't dependent upon scavenging them, and so more and more the fossil evidence suggests that more and more animal food was included in the diet. It takes a, a degree of behavioral sophistication to be able to make a sharp stone stick to the end of a spear. Now, did diet have anything to do with our sophistication? We believe that it does. We believe that increasingly we started to include more omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. We believe that as we became more and more dependent on omega-3 fatty acids, that also facilitated increased brain growth, increased behavioral sophistication. So by following this dietary path here, we were getting smarter, and you know, the more sophisticated and the better able to survive and take care of ourselves. Literally, the evolution of the human brain was dependent upon animal foods. We would not be sitting here speaking to one another had not those guys way back there started to eat animal foods. So as I understand it, then right next door is another critical time in history. That's absolutely right. 192,000 years ago in Africa, for the very first time, we see anatomically modern humans appearing 192,000 years ago. So the next stop along the line is when things really took a big hit. Well, that's right. Uh, when we look at anatomically modern humans, they left Africa perhaps give or take 20,000 years by about 70,000 years ago, and they headed east again. They went towards Australia. So about 45,000 years ago, we think uh, anatomically modern humans entered Europe. And we also believe that they were behaviorally modern by that time. We believe that they had full capacity for speech. We see sophistication in the tool making. We see art. We see burying of the dead. We see uh, musical instruments. We see cave oh, paintings. Wow. Yes. And so we actually, there's famous cave paintings in, in Europe where we actually see these humans hunting wild animals. So that's in France, right? In France, that's yeah, right, yeah. Let's shuffle forward to about 10,000 years ago, which is the half yard line. The half yard line? The half yard line, indeed. That was 10,000 years ago. Now that seems to be historically remote, but on an evolutionary basis, it's a drop in the bucket, isn't it? Let's shuffle on up there. And we look back, and that's a long way. So from that point until here, every human being on the planet ate wild plant 
and animal foods that they either hunt or gather. From that point to here, nobody drank milk or ate grain. So, so for the first time, we see humans eating dairy and wheat, and then there was another big change with that, right? That's right. With the Industrial Revolution, we started to include refined sugars, refined grains, and mixtures of these refined sugars, refined grains, refined oils. We call them processed foods. These are the ubiquitous foods in the typical American diet that comprise more than 70% of the average calories in the American diet. Right now? Right 70 now. 70% of everything that we eat stems from the industrial period, essentially. The industrial period forward. And actually, processed foods really didn't get going until about 1900, 1920. So let's go down to that point here on our evolutionary time scale. And let me point down here to this. If we take a look at the last fifth of the last inch, we're talking... Right in front of your fingernail. <laughs> right in front of my fingernail. The last fifth of the last inch of this entire evolutionary time scale, that's when humanity started to generally eat processed foods. Now tell me, my God, when you look back at that distance to here, is it any wonder that we are having trouble with our diet? We are so far off base from what we are genetically programmed to eat. The second leg of our search takes us to New York City. First to meet with the American Museum of Natural History's Gary J. Sawyer, physical anthropologist. Sawyer specializes in the forensic reconstruction of our extinct relatives based on the most up-to-date evidence of where and how our ancestors lived. We do not know how to eat properly. We feed ourselves, but we fail to give ourselves the proper nutrition. And after a while, it becomes cumulative, and that's when we start developing degenerative diseases. I'd like to welcome to the Hall of Human Origins. We're going to take a, a big leap in time now into what we call the very early Paleolithic. If you'll follow me over this way, okay. I'll be able to explain to you. Great. We're now two million years into the past. What I'd like to point out is the environment where these people lived, all open grassland, what we call savanna. Um, there's trees in the background but it's very open, very dangerous territory for them. So when we hear that the earliest modern humans came from Africa and came mm -hmm. from the savanna, this is a representation of this that? This is an excellent representation. Uh, what I'd like now to do is show you something. All right, this is a uh, fossilized skull, approximately two million years old, uh, in excellent condition uh, to find uh, a, a, a specimen like this so perfectly preserved. These people were now becoming more and more meat eaters. And we feel that this had a great deal to do with expansion of the brain. Our bodies evolved the way they are now quickly. Mm -hmm. Our brain, however, took a while to catch up. However, with a high protein diet, that's what they had, that was the secret for encephalating our brain and for the, the greater intelligence that we have today. Does that mean growing our brain, getting more? Uh, yes, it, it does. It okay. Does. Yeah, they would, they would actually crack open uh, the skulls of these animals uh -huh. and actually get the brain tissue out, which is high in cholesterol, uh, uh -huh. break open the long bones and get, oh, the, get, the, marrow the, get the marrow out and okay. eat that. So already early fossil humans were consuming meat. Right, okay. and, and, that, and that made a big difference in our evolution and, and how our brains and, developed. And, and That's we, we believe it made all that. the difference in our evolution. Uh, if we had stayed as vegetarians, uh, in all probability, I wouldn't be speaking to you on this particular high level of intellect. This, this is a, a diorama that features uh, uh, anatomically modern humans, just like you and I, albeit uh, very primitive. Uh, if you look at the background, they're living in a tundra environment, but they've already constructed a house, uh, a very interesting house made of uh, mammoth bones. It's all bone, mammoth it's bones? It's all, all mammoth bones, correct. These are what we call anatomically modern humans, just like you and I, identical in all respects, same form of intelligence, everything. However, they're still living in the Paleolithic, which means that their diet, so to speak, is lean meat, any form of vegetation they could get, fruits, berries, nuts, fish, okay? Everything is coming from a world that was pristine. 
as opposed to a world today that is, that is highly polluted, okay? The humans here are modern like you and I, they are, they are clothed. Uh, we know that they use needles uh, to sew their clothing. They're actually burying some meat right here. Oh, right there. Right there they are, right? Is that their right refrigeration system? Their, their there. refrigeration system. Okay, so they're, they're advancing considerably, okay? okay? They're still what we call in the Stone Age. They're still making their tools of stone and bone. No metal exists before this. Okay. So we're roughly dealing with a period maybe 30, 40,000 years BP before the present, all right? Okay. Just before a big change would start taking place in human evolution a change we call a dietary change. So this is just before the beginning of agriculture, just before the big switch over in, in a different phase of human evolution. Right. And this was nu nutritionally um, superior, this kind of diet. This represents the pre-agricultural age. After that, we start to decline. Things okay? change. Things, Things change. change. Things change. The foods that were available to them in nature is what helped move evolution forward, right? We believe so, definitely. You know, it was a struggle. It was a struggle. It was survival of the fittest. And today, we are it. We're the end product of that long survival. Also located in New York is the Wintergren Foundation for Anthropological Research. We support significant and innovative research into humanity's biological and cultural origins, development, and variation. Evolutionary anthropologist and president of the foundation, Leslie Aiello's research, focuses on the evolution of human adaptation, including evolution of diet, the brain, language, and cognition. What we call the ideal human diet depends on what we call human, because we've had seven million years of human evolution, uh, that being defined as the time that we separated from our closest living ancestors, the chimpanzees. But throughout that seven million years, uh, we weren't human as we would define it today. And for probably five million years throughout that time period, if we saw one of these ancestors on the street, we'd recognize them as a ape standing on two legs. And their diet was correspondingly different. It, it, it wasn't identical uh, to, to modern apes. But what we think is they were subsisting primarily on uh, vegetable materials, fruits, leaves, that type of thing, supplementing, of course, with, with a bit of uh, animal material. But at about two million years ago, we think the change really happened. And at this time, our ancestors, uh, we call them Homo erectus, were uh, radically different in body form. They were about 50%, again, as big as these earlier ancestors. And if you saw them on the street, they would look more like us. They would have the same body proportions, long legs, relatively short arms in relation to those legs, and very importantly, smaller teeth and jaws. Now, uh, this indicates that there was something definitely different about the diet of these ancestors at two or 1.7 mil million years ago. The question is what was different? Many of the earliest uh, modern humans were actually also very big individuals. And so, you know, so this idea that our early ancestors were small people and we've just gotten bigger since then really isn't true. And it looks like, you know, there were periods, you know, from these large individuals, many modern humans are much smaller. Our early hunter and gatherer ancestors, one of my old professors used to say this was the high period of human evolution and it's been downhill since then because that, that they were eating a huge diversity of foodstuffs. We go, go to the supermarket and when we make a salad, we think that we're eating a lot of different types of veggies and all. But in comparison to what our early ancestors were eating, this isn't true. You know, they had a huge di di diversity. Once you start uh, agriculture, you seriously reduce the variety in your food. And this also reduces the variety of nutrients you get. And what we think we're seeing when we see the uh, real reduction in the skeletons, when we see uh, uh, evidence in the skeletons of really nutritional de de deficiency, that what we're tracking is this reduction of the vari of variation in the diet. We aren't getting what we were, were built to need. And I think that that's the bottom line of it. 
In 2003, at a symposium on the evolution of the human diet, the known, the unknown, and the unknowable at the University of Arkansas, one remarkable development caught my attention above all others presented, that we were just now entering a period of exploding scientific understanding, with rapid changes in scientific technology bringing to light new facts about the human diet that were previously unknowable. Three years later, when I was interviewing Professor Cordain, he said, you really should talk to Mike Richards at the Max Planck Institute. He's got some new technology that can tell you exactly what humans ate in the past. On my way to Leipzig, Mike suggested I visit one of his department's dig sites in the south of France to see the human nutrition discovery process from start to finish. They came here, they were butchering these animals, they were leaving behind the bones and the stone tools. We want to know a little bit more about that. Were they, were they cutting off the, the meaty parts and taking those with them? Do you find evidence of those parts still here? What exactly was the process that, that led to the creation of this thick deposit of bones? Well, you're standing in the site of Jonzac, also known as Chez Pinot, a middle Paleolithic and early upper Paleolithic site that was really, it was, it was discovered in effect 100 years ago when they cut this road that we're standing in. They cut a road to get access to the limestone face here, which would, they then quarried. And when they built this road, they sliced through the site. And you can probably see the, the richness of the archaeological levels there. You see that tag that says SW08, and all those dark things in the section are stone tools. Oh. And so it's a very rich layer that appears as well down here. They didn't report it to anybody official. It didn't really make it into any publications. And the site went unnoticed again for about 100 years. And it was in the 1990s that a French geologist working in the region came here and took advantage of the road cut, came across the stone tools and the bones in the section, and brought it to the attention of a local French archaeologist. What we do is we, we study the bones and stone tools left behind by first Neanderthals and then modern people at the top of the sequence, and uh, reconstruct what kinds of uh, stone tools we find and what kinds of animals they were hunting at what periods and indeed were they hunting or did the, were the bones brought here by other kinds of animals like various kinds of carnivores and so forth. And are these all animal bones at this mm -hmm. point? Too? Yep, okay. all animal bones. And then that brings us up to this layer uh, of large limestone blocks that you see. Below those limestone blocks, mm -hmm. we know it's Neanderthals. Above that, those limestone blocks, we know it's moderns. Uh -huh. And during that time period, represented by those layers there, the change happened. And then what happened when those two groups met each other? Right. Did they indeed meet? What was that interaction like? And here, you would have had uh, hundreds of thousands of years of Neanderthals living here, well adapted to this region, doing perfectly well, probably, um, and then in come these modern individuals. Did, how did they react? What exactly happened? Well, and thus far, when it comes down to diet, can you, can you tell from, besides the ranger, obviously the animals that were here, can you tell us what they ate? Well, the, the evidence, for the most part, is going to come from the bones, because that's what's preserved. You have a large team here of individuals studying the fauna, and they can tell you a little bit more in detail about the kinds of things they're finding. That they're finding down yeah. there. Um, we've, we have found a lot of reindeer in the, in, during the excavation, and as you can see, um, some long bone of reindeer, and uh, we've got a scapula of reindeer there, just, just there, and a lot of rib. Is, is, is the preference for reindeer because reindeer was the animal that was here, or do we have a lot of reindeer because they really wanted reindeer, and there were horse and bison around, but they ignored those. Those are those are the kinds of questions. More selective. Ones. Exactly. Is there anywhere in this layering that you said Neanderthals completely disappeared? You don't find Neanderthals after that layer of roof fall. Uh, moderns came in. So mo modern humans, more like us? Yes, exactly like us. Exactly. Like yeah. Us. They were they were modern humans. They did. They, they had a brain that was organized, as far as we can tell, like ours. So you have to imagine these Neanderthals being uh, extremely capable uh, hunters, uh, extremely capable at uh, surviving in this environment. They were very intelligent, bipedal hominins, successfully adapting to this region, but yet at the same time, not quite us. Not quite. To me, that's what makes them so interesting.
we want to really understand if those Neanderthals were encountering anatomically modern humans, because we, were, we want to understand if they interact with each other. Because right after that, they disappeared. And of course, one of the big questions is why did they disappear? And what happened when they disappeared? Uh, it's certainly one of the bigger questions is, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of fun Why are we imagine. here and they're not here? Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, that exactly. Kind of thing. What happened? What happened exactly that, that our, our species is the one that was left standing? Would you say, based on the archaeological evidence, that they were healthy compared to humans today? Well, they were, fortunately, they were healthy because we, won't, we would not be here if they were not healthy. All of the fossils excavated at the dig are taken a few miles away to a field lab where they are identified, bagged, labeled, and logged prior to being taken back to the Department of Human Evolution's laboratories in Leipzig, Germany. Department Director Jean-Jacques Hublon spoke with me more specifically about what the Institute's research has discovered about early modern humans' health. Well, if it looks like Neanderthal and modern humans evolved as hunter-gatherers, were we healthy then and were we healthier than, than now? Well, I, I'm, I'm sure that they had a lot of, of uh, troubles uh, with their health, but uh, very different kind of problems than the one we have now. Uh, we live in a society which is very safe. We don't have much accidents. Uh, although we have violence, it's limited. Uh, and so we are mainly preoccupied with all the health problems related to our diet and our way of life. I think for the Neanderthals or for the uh, first modern humans in our uh, regions, uh, they were mostly preoccupied in finding food. And, um, and the kind of problems they had in their daily life uh, with their health was basically related to all the kind of accidents they could have looking for food and hunting animals. It's, it's very mm -hmm. unlikely that they had a lot of uh, obesity. What we can, what we can say, if just uh, looking at their skeletons, is that they were very, they look like very tall, very strong, and very healthy people in general. From, from the, the, the farmers, we have to suffer sometimes some kind of um, misadaptation uh, related to the fact that initially we were not really made to eat so much uh, cereals and, uh, and sugar and things like that. The next destination is the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology's Department of Human Evolution in Leipzig, Germany. Professor Mike Richards' research involves the application of stable isotope analysis of bone collagen to determine human and animal diets, as well as dietary changes in prehistoric and historic Europe. These are the things that I think uh, people are completely confused about. I mean, I certainly was growing up. You just think that these are, you know, it's good to have a glass of milk and it's, you know, that's good for you and have lots of cereals every day and these kind of things. But when you really think about it, you realize that these, these diets are not so good for you at all. I run a group uh, that's in a field called archaeological science. So we specialize in applying, you know, sort of hard science techniques to anthropology, archaeology. And I understand you're also working with early human diet here? Yeah, my main specialty is diet. I, I study bone chemistry as a way of getting at uh, what the diets of people and animals were in the past. And one of the main things we're looking at is the evolution of diets through time by trying to get this information from these bones themselves and doing scientific analysis of the composition of these bones. People have hypothesized that it's a trait of like the first homo, our species, is that it's uh, egg animal products is what led to our increased brain size and all the sort of things that we, we that set us apart from other primates. And the problem is you can, the evidence for this is circumstantial. You find tools that are being used to cut up animals, you find butchered animal bones, but there's no way to really tell what proportion of the diet that represented and plant foods just don't survive so they're invisible. So we have to use this this kind of study looking directly at the fossils themselves with the bone chemistry to really prove what proportion of their diet was coming from animal protein versus plant protein. Um, the first step is taking the sample that usually happens in the museum or in the field and uh, we try to take as small a sample as possible so maybe like the size of a thumbnail is what we what we can work with. Uh, when we get that sample back to the lab 
we clean off the outside layer to get rid of any sort of contaminants from the soil. Then we take that bone and we put it in hydrochloric acid and that dissolves away most of the bone because the, most of bone is mineral and that's where these contaminations from the soil will come in. So we want to get rid of that entirely and it leaves this protein. And then we take that um, freeze-dried collagen, white fluffy collagen, to the mass spectrometers and we measure the amount of carbon and nitrogen in it to make sure again that it's really collagen. And then we measure the isotope ratios. And with, when we get those numbers, we compare, for example, Neanderthals to animals that lived at the same time. So you know that if you have uh, reindeer, you know they're herbivores. And then if you have wolves, you know they're carnivores. So you build up this whole sort of food web with isotope values and you see how they all fit in. But when we pick up this story with the Neanderthals, which is the first time we can, then we do see really they are getting all their protein from animal sources. So as predicted, we pick that up. And then we see with modern humans as well, the same thing that you, uh, they're very successful because they're eating mostly animal protein as well. And very little plant foods in, in Europe, um, but a larger range of, of animal foods, including I think fish was a, was a big part of modern humans. So that's the idea we have of, of sort of paleo, the Paleolithic diet, that we see it for modern humans. It's a lot of animal protein, I think. I spent a lot of time working on Neolithic and post-Neolithic sites as well. And there you really do see the humans with much lower nitrogen isotope values, and they're clearly getting a lot of their protein from plants. As so, agriculture moves. As agriculture moves, yeah. Yeah. But, but before that, they had the same kind of values as the Neanderthal? Yeah, except for this addition of these extra f of fish. Of fish. That seems to be the big difference. The main difference. Yeah. So, um, until agriculture, were there any human, modern human vegetarians? I really don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I do not think so. And actually, it's extremely hard to find vegetarians, even um, ethnographically or archaeologically. I don't, in all the studies, we've measured thousands and thousands of humans from all over the world and I don't think I think we've yet to find a vegetarian or a vegan there's there's no way sometimes we do but then we go back and uh, realize that we actually sampled a cow or something by mistake yeah you uh, there are no vegans <laughs> until until recently so when you get really big villages people crowding together and having a really high I guess uh, cereal amount of cereals in their diet and you really see a difference in their bones and these diseases that you would never see in that you never saw in the Paleolithic, you start to see in, uh, in kind of high abundances. So does it make scientific sense as well as logical sense that, that we can learn things from their lifestyle that would then apply to us? I think so. I think you think of this evolutionary trajectory that made, that, that how these humans evolved to this state, the modern humans, we got to be this way. And it's over, you know, maybe 100,000 years of evolution to get to be this state of, of actually adapting to this diet of being a hunter-gatherer, moving around a lot, um, eating these wild foods. I think there's no question that for most of the time that we've been around, we had a really, um, that kind of uh, nomadic lifestyle with lots of sort of exercise and eating a lot of animal proteins uh, and some and wild plant foods. But if you just think of what's been successful in terms of us as a species, we've survived you know, 100,000 years. And most of that, 95% of that, was this kind of adaptation, was eating these animal uh, these wild animal foods, plant foods, with lots of exercise. That's what we've been very successful at. It's a new experiment now. This Neolithic is a very short period of time. It's, you know, since we've been around, less than 10% maybe, the modern humans have been around. So, I don't know, maybe it's, you know, if you think of it that way, I mean, what we are adapted to is not what we're living right now. This um, kind of Paleolithic diet, I guess, is, the, is the, probably the most optimum for, for modern humans. It has to be. It's what, you know, we you know, evolutionary pressures got us towards, you know, and we were successful in that kind of diet. So I think it is the, the it's got to be the best diet for humans. If this way of eating is the best diet for humans, I wanted to understand how we could use this knowledge now in our modern world. I called Professor Cordain to see if anyone, medical professional or scientist, was putting this evolutionary nutrition method of eating into practice with real patients. He suggested I contact Dr. Lane Sebring at the Sebring Clinic in Wimberley, Texas, who is having extraordinary results with his patients employing just such an evolution-based method of eating. One of the things I, I tell my patients, you know, it's nice to know improvement's possible. Every year the doctor adds a new pill to your list and you've got another problem and the hope starts to fade. I sort of break food into two categories, human food and non-human food. And the human foods would be the the lean meat, chicken, fish, turkey, etc. preferably from an animal eating what it's designed to eat. Um, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. The non-human food would be the grains, which is probably the worst problem we've got. Um, dairy after two years old, we're not designed for dairy after two years old, certainly not from another animal. 
uh, beans and potatoes. And so those are the simple categories that I put them in. And people understand that, I understand that. And it helps me to make choices. Grains cause us to lose height. Um, they cause a narrowing of the sphenoid bone here. Our bones aren't strong enough to support the full weight. And so, and the buttress the skull, and so this is narrowed. This bone now is, is narrowed down. And so we have smaller brains as a result of eating grains. We have more scrunched up noses we can't breathe through. And we have a jaw that can't hold a full complement of teeth. And so we get overlapping teeth or we have no room for our wisdom teeth. And that's common to all civilized groups on the, on the planet um, because they eat grains. And that happened when that began and it follows the introduction of grains into the diet. They bring in gluten, they bring in yeast, they cause a chronic inflammatory state of the gut. And as a big um, initiator of almost all our chronic inflammatory diseases, autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, virtually absent in the archaeologic record prior to the institution of grains into the diet. I try to get patients to realize what they need to do is to think about protein as time-released glucose. Okay? You think about protein, the liver can take protein and turn it into glucose in a time-release fashion. Work harder makes more. Okay? That's how we're truly designed. How beautiful is that? So you've got steady energy all day long. But if you eat a bunch of carbohydrates, then the insulin level goes up and insulin goes to the liver and shuts off the conversion of protein into glucose. So now, if you had a steak for breakfast, you can't get to it for energy, you see? And so your, in, your sugars are gonna start crashing pretty soon. And at that point, the only way to get it back up is either to rest a little bit, and you can, you can sort of stuff more protein in and then that'll bring it up. But a lot of times at that point, they're craving carbs. They want something quick, they want it now. They don't feel good. Each meal should start with a major source of protein. Surround that with all the vegetables you want. And then in between meals, if you want some fruits and nuts, or maybe even with the meal, you can do that as well. Like I like to throw nuts in a big green salad. You know, sometimes fruit in there as well. And uh, if you need a, a, a work, those two work, uh, the fruits and nuts work great for snacks. Doctor, here we are at Brookshire Brothers Supermarket. Right. supermarket here in town right. and most people shop in a regular supermarket and you know they want to really know and understand what they should buy and what they shouldn't buy when they go shopping so right. how about we go inside and you show us what to do The healthiest meat are the larger cuts of meat, you know, um, you want to get larger cuts of meat. Um, and so, you know, here we've got uh, some pork tenderloin, uh, here's some more of my favorite here, sirloin steak, um, looking for, here we go, some ribeyes. Let's, make, let's get some distinctions here, because a lot of people that are on the run or whatnot, they'll get frozen vegetables or canned vegetables, mm -hmm. and they don't feel like they have time to refresh. Is it any good for us? Well, between the frozen and the canned, mm -hmm. Frozen is much better, much better for you. Um, it's not, they often add some salt, but here's some collard greens, etc. But these are frozen, they're usually quick frozen, uh, and so maintain their freshness. In right. some cases, the frozen can be even better than old, fresh, that's been laying around for a while, because this sort of, uh, for the most part, can stop any sort of uh, decline by freezing. Romaine lettuce is much better for you than the iceberg lettuce. Uh, there's a lot more in it. It's just fresh, a lot more nutritional fresh, value. A lot more nutritional value in it. Uh, the color tells you an awful lot. The more color it's got, the better it is for you. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to be careful because there's an awful lot of pesticides used in red bell peppers and strawberries and a few things like that because uh, they have to do that if they're not going to be grown organically. Here we've got some beautiful fruit. Each one of these is going to be loaded with nutrients. It, it's really hard to overdo this. If you're diabetic, you need to be careful not having too much fruit. Quick, one know, of these you a day. That there's still a lot of fruit sugar in fruit. There right? is, right? Fructose, and fructose can do some bad things to you in high amounts. Right. Especially if you're diabetic. Uh, exercise undoes that damage, by the way, that, and that's another lecture. But this is an excellent source of. Uh, especially of, of energy through the day. You know, eat half an apple in between a meal, it's great. You know, and then eat the other half later. Or an orange, it doesn't really matter. You should eat the orange and not the orange juice. Orange juice can be way too much sugar. 
people hear a lot of times uh, whole grain oatmeal. Whole grains have problems, nutritional problems that the refined grains don't. So you can't win either way. Oh, they have their own set of problems. Oh, they have their own set of problems. The whole, whole grain thing that's coming up now actually creates a, a new set. Oh. It's, a, it's a gimmick. Okay. It's, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're touting whole grain. Sounds kind of like wholesome. <clears throat> they put have hearts on there, right? Healthy sure. pure heart. Right. That's what you know, um, and that's what we're led to believe. But it's marketing. So and, and so, what are the new problems that you get if you have a whole grain? Well, again, it holds a lot of the minerals in the gut. You can't absorb those. Okay. It it blocks the absorption of a lot of the nutrients we need. So it actually raises your uh, appetite and increases your need for a good multiple vitamin that you should take separate from the whole grains. You take a multiple vitamin with minerals and you've got a bunch of grains that go with that, you're not gonna get any of it. Okay, so you were giving me that top list of things to avoid and that included bread, the staple of American life. Right. Pretty much. That's what, it, unfortunately, it's not good for us. Okay. If we don't change some things, we're not gonna fix this problem. So, here's a um, white bread. There's not much in here that's good for you at all. It blocks, again, it blocks absorption of nutrients, it causes, promotes osteoporosis, etc. Uh, it's, it's, it's sugar. Two slices of French bread, uh, a quarter cup of sugar, and a medium baked potato are virtually identical. Oh, okay, so two pieces of French bread are the same as a quarter cup of sugar. Exactly. Baked potato, same right. as a quarter. Some sugar. people, the sugar goes up faster uh, with the bread than it does with the quarter cup of sugar. Really? Yes. Now that's interesting. Yeah. So not everyone, but most, pe uh, but some people. So and here we've got oat nut, oatmeal bread. Yeah. This is there you go. this is supposed to be good for us, but it's not. This okay. actually has problems that this one doesn't have. Okay. It actually holds more of the minerals into the gut from being absorbed than this one does. Because it's got the whole grain. It's got the in whole there, thing so. in there, and that those that particular those molecules bind up a lot of our minerals that we need. So this whole new once again this whole grain push that's going on now, kind of coming out of like, the whole against the low carb thing. They're right. saying, oh, this is much healthier for you. It's not. Uh, it's just not accurate. It's, it's a marketing strategy, much like selling us on soy. Okay. Okay. All right. So there's, there's really not good for you. Okay, this is a no. Very good. This is, this is big this on is, the no this list. Is big on the no list. Now, okay, here's a perfect example of something that could be marketed as fat-free. And fat-free is supposed to be good for us. Let me come around this side. Yeah. Fat-free is supposed to be good for us, but in fact, and there's no fat in here. So it's fat free, but there's nothing worse for you on the planet than to eat all this sugar. But it's got butter right on the front. <laughs> <laughs> right, but it's not. There's so no it's fat it's free, sugar. and there's nothing worse for you. I think those corn syrup. Ah, okay. okay. This is what you're really trying to avoid. Clogs up your arteries. That's the number one ingredient. So that's about all it is. Ah, okay. After that is salt. So there's nothing in there that you want. Right, and that's true sure. true for probably most of the syrups and those kinds of things. Then you've got the sugar-free version, and then you have to worry about what have they put in here. It's probably not found in nature. It's probably something completely manufactured. Our body knows nothing of what to do with it, and often works as neurotransmitters in the brain that mess, us, or mess up our thinking, cause fogging of thinking, etc. Even shown to produce depression. Here's something off the shelf. Look at this. My goodness, it, it, it almost looks like candy. Well, like at Halloween that you would get all these sugar and... That's exactly what it is. It's just coated with thick icing on these little mini uh, wheats. And so the ingredients here is whole grain wheat. We've already talked about the fact that how there's nothing in wheat that's good for you, really. I mean, if you look at it, it's, it's kind of the scourge of health. It's the beginning of the downfall of our health. Sugar is next, sorbitol, gelatin, reduced iron. They're throwing in some minerals in here, which are not going to be absorbed because right. of the grains. Hold that. And it's whole grains, so it's going to hold it even more. So this is, you're better off not eating than eating this. And unless you're dying of starvation, you can't get any sugar to the brain. This will help you get sugar to the brain, and that's all it'll do for you. Every once in a while, it looks to me like maybe some of the good stuff is hidden in the middle of the This is about it. Aisles. From what oh, I this, can, is I mean, from, from, this is about it. Here you can, here you've got some walnuts, 
Very good food. Oh, these are great. Pecans, almonds. These, they're, they're hard to overdo. So this is a yes. This is a yes. Uh, this is a big yes. There's just so many just... things here in the store that can do us damage if we're not really aware, if we don't. The answer is, in truth, almost all of it. Almost all of it. You, if you go to the fruits and the nuts and the vegetables and the lean meats and chicken, and then, then you're good. It's, it's wonderful for you, you know. And people are here at the checkout in this little town, they see me checking out, and, and, and I'm pretty good about how I eat. And they see and they just think, oh, I wish I was going to your house for dinner, you know. But I've loaded up the steaks and the roasts and all the fresh greens and salads. It's much more color. And then here comes somebody right behind me with, you know, and they're kind of hiding their stuff because they know what I do and how I think about it. And, and uh, I had a patient one time that told me, she said, you know, Dr. Steve, after reading about this, and I realized that nothing we bought was good for us. Nothing we ate was good for us. I shop very differently now. That's a lot quicker shopping. I'm just in and out. I grab these two things and I'm right out. I don't have to peruse the aisles and trying to figure out, is this good for me or that? I already know it's not. When we started eating meats, that allowed the brain to double in size. But over 25% of our energy is used in, in um, the brain. And, uh, and I've seen studies as high as 70%, depending on what, what factors they're looking at. So we got this compact source of food, which was animal with their proteins and fats, that uh, very nutrient dense. And that allowed us then to double the brain size. So you know, we don't want to forsake that. There's a reason why, why that worked that way. And when we do, we get into trouble. And uh, uh, you know, I, sometimes I feel like we're on the precipice here of falling off. If we don't, you know, I feel like that, you know, maybe we've just learned just enough in, uh, in time through Cordain and, and Boyd Eaton, etc., that that's going to give us the knowledge we can, we'll, we'll grab ourselves before we fall off the precipice of health here. We're just going, it's going fast and nobody's paying attention. Everybody's got their individual plan for, for themselves, basically, to perpetuate their uh, wealth or what have you. And instead of looking at the big picture, they're not thinking about their kids, their grandkids. I mean, nutritionists, a lot of them are saying that the children born today won't outlive their parents because they've never had good nutrition. And I've got 11-year-old type 2 diabetics. In type my 2 is a dietary-induced diabetic? Dietary-induced. And when I first graduated medical school, I never saw anybody under 55 with type 2 diabetes. I've got children hadn't even hit puberty yet, and uh, they've got type 2 diabetes. And, and so we're, we're, we've made a lot of mistakes here, and, and we're, uh, hopefully uh, we can turn this around. My 10-year global search for the perfect human diet has been an amazing and enlightening treasure hunt, revealing a wealth of ancestral and traditional dietary insights, as well as the most recent anthropological understandings of our species' dietary evolution. But what I find most fascinating is the knowledge that has been unlocked through technological advancements in the anthropological sciences namely, hard scientific proof of what was previously unknowable, what we actually ate to develop the health, strength, and brain power to become the dominant species on the planet. We can now clearly see that whenever and wherever domesticated grains and plant foods became our species' major source of protein, our health declined, and that animal proteins and fats are irreplaceable in an optimal human diet. This knowledge is a game changer. Clearly, the prevailing media and government message is that meat and animal protein are inherently unhealthy and we should be eating less. But I hope that what we've learned on our search will elevate and inspire the public conversation to include the fullest range of what is now known about the authentic human diet and that it will eventually be enthusiastically embraced by our government officials when forming public policy. Do I think we can find our way out of the obesity epidemic? I mean, the techniques are there to get us out of it. Whether people choose to adopt those techniques and methods is another question. If they do, unquestionably, we can get out of it. It's easy to get out of it. What's the definition of a fad? Generally, a fad is a short-term thing that a whole bunch of people are, to use a word that didn't used to exist, glomming onto uh, because somebody has just decided to publicize it or make it famous. And so let's see, could a fad diet be something that our ancestors were eating for thousands of years? I don't think that fits into the word fad. I didn't invent this diet. All we did is we uncovered what was already there. We uncovered the diet that all human beings ate on this planet until 10,000 years ago. So we did detective work in finding out what that diet is, but don't attribute this diet to me. There'll be other scientists that'll come along 
But the fundamental tenet of this diet will not be, ever be shown to be wrong because it's based upon our genes and it's based upon evolution through natural selection. I think you have to go back to what we are being most successfully adapted to to this point. So I think the processed, I mean, the refined sugars, if you're gonna get rid of those, I think you have to have more exercise that has to be built in. I mean, our uh, Paleolithic humans were moving around all the time. There's a lot of exercise. I think meat eating is important and uh, processing food, like cooking meat and all those kind of things. It's the big, th it's the, what separates us as a, as a primate from the other primates, I think. We have the same biology that our ancestors did and that biology is uh, oriented toward the lifestyle, including the diet, that they uh, enjoyed at that time. Very often the word convenience come up, comes up, you know, well this is not convenient, that's not convenient, and I've said over and over and over again, health is not convenient, but it's not half as inconvenient as a fatal illness, uh, which would you like to choose? I know that for me, once I understood the full story of our dietary evolution, it made sense to embrace the perfect human diet's optimal method of eating in order to live a full, healthy, and happy life, especially given my heart condition. I've been eating this way for more than five years now, and much to the amazement of my doctors, my blood work clearly illustrates that was absolutely the right decision. But what gives me the most hope that we can solve our epidemic of obesity and chronic disease is that there is both a new groundswell of interest in ancestral health and more practicing physicians like Dr. Lane Sebring are successfully using these evolutionary nutrition principles with patients, proving daily that eating a perfect human diet of human foods and eliminating non-human foods makes sense, ends patient confusion, and most importantly, is both practical and sustainable. Thankfully, we don't have to wait for the government or the media to expand their scientific understanding to take advantage of these crucial discoveries. This is a method of eating any of us can adopt beginning with our next meal. As David Getoff pointed out earlier, there are those who will cry that this is just another fad diet, a passing obsession that will be forgotten in a few short years. But when I asked Lauren Cardane's colleague, Dr. Boyd Eden, about that misconception, I think he summed it up perfectly. If this is a fad diet, then it's a two million year old fad.